everyone and hope that you join our Awesome 10X Inner Circle simply by going to www.awesome10x.com. Learn more and this is one of those classes. So silver and green, what do I mean? Most people are aware that we are transitioning already away from oil into solar and what does silver have to do with it? So what may have been the prior... Uh, Digital safe havens, would pro uh, what probably were safe havens before was gold. It was actually obliterated by BTC. What, whereas, um, what does silver have in mind? Why am I talking about silver and green in your portfolio? So why is silver even valuable? By its inherent nature, the element silver, AG, has an extremely high reflection for light, hence its usage in mirrors. It is the most electrically conductive metal of all. It's the best thermal transmitter of all metals. It is germicidal, thus used in various antibacterial applications, easily malleable and ductile, only slightly harder than gold. It is only produced in the star supernova, which is a very rare and precious thing on Earth. And so because of that, because of its highly uh, conductive metal, it is actually a core element for the manufacturing of all the solar panels in the world. It is heavily used in all solar panel conductivity, and the average panel today of approximately 2 square meters can use up to 20 grams of silver. There is a silver paste in the solar photovoltaic cells that collects the electrons generated when the sunlight hits the panel. Because of silver's high conductivity, it maximally converts sunlight into electricity. Let's take a look at um, the levelized cost of electricity for a solar PV. It's currently the most competitive among all fossil fuel generation sources. And it will be fully competitive in a few years' time. So we got that. Actually, this was um, a forecast that was actually changed. Because in 2018, we already got, actually last year, 2020, we already got two cents per kilowatt hour. So you'll notice from 37 cents to 8 cents, we actually reached 2 cents or another 75% increase and it uh, decreased and it didn't take about 8 years. So, um, wait up, I need to like mute everyone. Okay, okay, let's discuss. So given the fact that um, we, we were estimating before that we were going to hit that 2 cents per kilowatt hour in 2030. We actually achieved that 10 years earlier. And so all of these electrification is happening faster than expected. And fossil fuel is expected to decline over time. And a lot of your companies and even your states, your government, have pledged by 2035 the specific carbon, uh, carbon neutral world. Historical data is showing to you the representation of new installations in a specific year and all the future projected value. These are all the wind and solar cost reduction potential. Now, compared to 2018 levels, this was the expected cumulative growth of solar panel photovoltaic capacity. It was expected to grow sixfold by 2030 with a figure of about 10% until 2050. Results are saying that these forecasts are actually too conservative. So it is actually one of the reasons why, if you think about it, your portfolio, when I say silver and green, I'm really talking, well, you could even argue silver and yellow. So we're talking about the sun. As in the solar, uh, you want to have a lot of uh, solar-related photovoltaic panels, one of which that we have been talking about in our inner circle has been the company Canadian Solar, also the company for solar. So those are some of the best solar panel makers. Take note that uh, Sun Power has um, um, spun off their solar panel manufacturer, which is Maxion, M-A-X-N. It was given as a property dividend. So first, Solar Canadian Solar and Maxion are actually some of the biggest solar panel makers in the world, as well as Jinka Solar, JKS, those four. Okay. Um, let's take a look. Annual solar PV additions are expected to reach up to 270 gigawatts in 2030 and 372 gigawatts in 2050 under the renewable energy map compared to just 94 gigawatts in 2018. I would argue that this threefold or tenfold increase is not going to happen in 30 years' time. It's going to happen within 10 years' time. The acceleration because of government of China and U.S. 
So they have already discussed in their five-year plans, 10-year plans, that this, this will all get accelerated. It will mean that there will be a huge replacement towards sustainable energy in our next decade ahead. Okay, let's, th let's talk about what researchers have been saying. Why did solar energy become cheap? Well, in 1954, there were already the very first solar photovoltaic cells. So that was about 60, sorry, 70, approximately 70 years ago. So 67, 67 years ago, we've gotten um, people from Germany saying that you could do a large scale, uh, competitively cheap. And China was actually one of the best uh, reasons why solar became cheap. When you have installations of solar power, it triggers investments leading to innovation. Uh, countries like China and Germany, Europe, built a lot of factories and machines making solar panels. And every time solar capacity doubled, the total price of solar energy actually falls by about 30%. And because um, you keep on doubling the amount of solar capacity, this is what you call the Moore's Law. So really fast decline of solar and therefore it's now really the most economical electricity for the world. Um, it catalyzed the learning curve as well. So solar energy became cheap and it made in it, it used to be just a competition for coal and now it's actually not a competition. All the coal plants are cheaper to shut down and replace with cheap uh, solar panels. So that there's a lot of uh, practical studies on that. In fact, in sunny parts of the world, such as, say, India, it could even hit one kilowatt. Um, I saw already that Abu Dhabi is two cents per kilowatt hour. I'll show you later some slides if you want to see those, um, those numbers. In a purely open market, these incredibly low prices are driving the world's remaining coal plants into bankruptcy, stealing some of the best profitable operating hours, even from a cheap natural gas plant. Other analysts are less optimistic. Um, the learning rate can be applied to the total cost of power uh, of solar or just the capital costs. So in the next couple of decades, actually, I'd say this is not the next couple of decades. All of these forecasts were 2018. All of that is wrong. It all happened already by 2020. So today, 2021, we are already in the one to three cent category. Even in California, it's at three cents per kilowatt hour. So electricity grids must also fix problems of intermittency. Skies are dark at night in the winter. The attractiveness of solar depends on how well an electricity grid can, can manage demand and store energy. As for that battery storage, we also have a solution already. It's called your microgrids, which Clean Spark is doing, which is another awesome Phoenix pick. So the price of solar always depends on sunlight financing and government support. Might I say that as of this time, you don't really need a lot of subsidies. Uh, it's already cheaper. So even if the government of California and U.S. has supported even China and Europe, um, the beautiful thing right now is that even the practical cost is so cheap, uh, you don't need the government to push it as further. Let's, let's talk a lot about the real-time, real-world applications of industrial silver other than solar. So we talked about solar panels, um, but take note that these are the sectors that are all using silver. You've got batteries, automobile switches, pharmaceutical creams, wind dressings, musical instruments, dentistry, chemical production, all of your electrics, electronics, car glass and mirrors, clothing, medical equipment, photography, tinting, sunglasses, surgical masks, air conditioned vents. Solar panels are being used for nanoparticles, RFID technologies, 3D printing for your spaceships, producing antifreeze, medical implants, pool purification, nanoparticles, hospital surfaces, solders, engine bearings, DVD, CD, superconductors, deodorant, weather modification, x rays, water purification. In fact, even if you were just looking at solar panels alone, that would be enough of about at least 10% of all the demand is in solar which is expected to grow at least three to four fold. Let's talk about the physical bar and the coin demand. 2000 to 2007, this is 11,000. You hit a 4X move in 2008 to 2015 and seven years. Okay, so the demand was partly industrial. What happened here? A lot of computers. A lot of your computers and electronics are all using silver. Your cell phone actually uses silver. So let's talk a lot about this. Global efforts has been reducing fossil fuel reliance 
legislation is lowering carbon emissions and favorable government tax policies. These will result in a continued expansion of solar panel installations over the next decade. For example, in California, they've mandated that all the new residential homes should be built with a solar electricity system. That company, which is actually building that residential home, is one of our awesome tenant picks. That is Sun Power. 50% of all the new residential homes, all of that is actually Sun Power clientele, that residential home builder. Solar power is a competitive uh, option for power generation at industrial sites, particularly in remote locations with favorable conditions, such as mine sites in South Africa, Chile, Western Australia, providing further upside for silver and solar demand. Importantly, with silver possessing the lowest electrical resistance among all metals at standard temperatures, potential substitute metals cannot match silver in terms of energy output per solar panel. Further, due to the technical hurdles, non-silver photovoltaic cells tend to be less reliable and have shorter lifespans, presenting serious issues for their widespread commercial development. We are expecting silver demand in photovoltaic to remain at elevated levels over the next coming decade. From 2020 to 30, 2030, the PV sector expected to consume a cumulative cumulative 888 MOZ of silver, equivalent to an average of 81 MOZ per year. Let's talk about the world supply and demand year on year. These are the exact numbers um, from Silver Institute. I'll show you the exact study later on. Millions of ounces, you could see that mine production, it's almost um, just the same every year. We are producing, the mines are producing that. You've got these recycling. So we only have in a single year about 1,000 million ounces total supply. Now take a look at the demand. As of 2020, this 963 might actually reach double or triple. So let's take a look. Which is the largest of the industrial demand? Here you've got about 475 or about 500, meaning 50% of the supply um, of, the of the one that is buying silver is actually your industrial, all of your electronics. 10%, meaning 96, is actually photovoltaic. PV, this 96 versus 978 is exactly 10%. Now, take a look. Photography might be low. That's fine. Uh, jewelry might not be going up. Sure. Silverware might not be going up. It's just stagnant. Net physical investment might not be going up much. But even on just this PV arm, 68 going to 96, if this hits 200 to 300, you've got um, a balance supply issue here. So the market balance right now, take note, 978, 963. If your demand goes above the supply, what happens? Price shoots up. So the market balance, you can see right now, is already having a difficulty. So you are having difficulty somehow within the next couple of years. Take note the silver prices. As of 2011, when you've got an almost equal demand supply, it was $35. And as of 2020, you've got it $15. Ask yourself whether it should be at $35 or should it be at $15, considering 2020 to 2030 is going to get more demand than less demand. Okay, let's take a look at as well. So you already know that the global annual silver production is about thousand million ounces. This is an actual number. So Peru, Mexico, China, Chile, Australia, USSR, low, and, and so forth. So you are mining, but we cannot actually go above a thousand million ounces. So no matter what you do, every year, we only have a thousand million ounces. Longer term, the industrial demand is looking to be something like this. You've got an increase of industrial demand from your BEVs, electric vehicles, Batteries, hybrids, this is the PV installation, and is the light-duty vehicle production. If you are bullish on electric vehicles, you cannot help but say that all the Tesla lights or Tesla disciples, neowites, um, what do I call them? Neowites, Xpengites, BYDites, all basically the industrial revolution needs what? The industrial metal, which is silver. So we are entering into a fourth industrial revolution. We talked about additive manufacturing, the factories of the future, all automated by these robots. Well, would these robots need some silver, copper, nickel, a lot of these? Yes, the answer is yes. These are just one of the few factors that should ignite 
the silver bowl in you. Let's talk about more. The outlook for shock. Sorry. Uh, wait. Let's share it again. The outlook for recycling is mixed. Okay. Tighter waste legislation up points to ongoing small gains in the industrial scrap. But this will be offset by further losses in photographic scrap as the pool of old x-rays diminishes. There's little to suggest either structural gains or losses for jewelry or silverware scrap. Looking beyond COVID-19 crisis, there are underlying things that could emerge in the next few years. This is the eventual dominance of hybrid, all the battery electric vehicles. This matters as both have higher silver loadings than vehicles with an ICE. TV demand may soften as thrifting continues and the growth in installation slows. However, it's becoming more resilient as falling costs make it less dependent on government subsidies, which can change rapidly and as the geographical spread of installations widens. Other areas such as 5G are also promising and many of silver's established demand areas look solid. As such, industrial demand should offer enduring gains. Let's take a look at the 10 biggest silver mining companies. So these are the top 10 in the world. Industrias, Penoles, Sabde, CV, Polymetal, Fresnillo, Pan American Silver, Wheaton Precious Metals, Coor Mining, Buenaventura Mining, Hecla Mining, First Majestic Silver Corp, Fortuna Silver Mines. Okay, so the first three is not in the U.S., so they're actually OTC. And then the others are all traded in the New York Stock Exchange. So the first three are in OTC, therefore less liquidity. This is Fresnillo. So it rallied from as low as 6 to as high as 18. We are back to the 50% region of $12 and started to move up. Industrias Penoles is the largest. Okay, you could see that it used to trade at $50, felt as low as $5. So far, we are getting a reversal 12 to 13. Since we are bullish solar, we couldn't help but say this is a bullish move back to about $25. Polymetal International, another large company, but it's not listed in New York. So these are all OTC names. Take note that from 2020, even 2020, 14 went to 28 or a double, consolidated to 1920, and we're now back to 21. So you are seeing actually a bullish uptrend. But because of the lack of li liquidity, because of their OTC nature, it's very hard to say that we will actually buy these companies. Let's talk a lot about some companies are actually listed in the more liquid New York Stock Exchange. This is Pan American Silver Corp, P-A-A-S. Notice 11 or 12 to 40 and then 30. What could you say here? If you're in the OTC, nobody likes you, nobody loves you. If you're in the New York Stock Exchange, even if you're the number fourth company that's the biggest miner in the world, silver miner in the world, you get some love. Take note that this got listed 2011. It's going to break near all-time highs if it breaks $40. So it has consolidated just like the couple of months ago when the market is consolidating. Even so, we are seeing that this is actually a bullish flag in the monthly zone and the support at 30 is likely to support, to get support. So you could actually put this in your watch list, ticker symbol, PAAS. Take a look at the $30 format there. It looks to be a support. Let's take a look at other things. Wheat and precious metals, also traded in New York Stock Exchange. Take a look. In the last 10 years, so you saw that silver used to be correlated because it used to be $35. It fell to $15. Despite the fact that silver actually had a lower price, and so the miners had to sell it at half the price, notice that it has been ranging. Why do you think that in 2020, it broke that $35 wheat ton, and after that breakout, rallied to 56 came back to that prior resistance, which turns to be support. It's very clear that you are, uh, for the technicians out there, that WPM actually has a huge support at 35. It is your 10-year resistance, and it's acting to be your 10-year support. So far, with silver rising above $25, it's now hitting 42. The question remains, all right, let's take a look at each company. What happened here? The mania of 1980. Is it correct that I'm seeing Coor Mining Used to trade at $300, fell all the way to $9 to $10. Yes, during 1980s, there was actually an inflation spike. And the, the one that happened was people were storing silver because silver and gold were the companies, or sorry, were the, were the metals that they, could, they, that they believed in. So a lot of the people who are actually buying silver and gold are actually your doomsday preppers, the same people who are also Bitcoin maximalists. 
they are the ones who say that you print your money, you'd have um, a problem in the future. Inflation will catch up on you. And these people are of the view that silver is, of course, that asset that will appreciate over time because these are real assets that are valuable, not paper that you print over time and print it to worthlessness. Now, if you're of the assumption that we are going to go into that mania phase of the 1980s, wherein gold and silver had their greatest days, wherein the dollar was really nothing, um, you, you see that many people are in the BTCs and that was their prime nar narrative. Okay, so let's understand this miner. This miner went from $300 all the way to as low as about $9 to $10 now. Even if you were buying it last year, say $3, this was even as low as $2. It's now hitting 7 and 9 Will this go to 16 I think that because this is in the top 10 world silver mines, the answer is a yes. It's a one of the oldest mines, so likely the reserve is very very low versus the last 34 years. But the market seems to be agreeing that there is something in this, um, in this company. I didn't do fundamental basis, by the way. I'm just doing macro. So if you want to do fundamentals, you could check this out. CDE Core Mining. We'll have to check how much research they have, given that they've been listed since 1980s or about 40 years already. Another company that's listed in the New York Stock Exchange is BVN, Compania de Minas Buenaventura. Okay, so what exactly is the reason why all these silver mines from 2013 to 2021, it seems as if from $40 to $10, it just fell in price of about almost 70 to 80% of their value. In fact, you could even argue that the drop of $6 of 2020 was similar to the lows of 2016. I say that it was really about the fact that demand supply, um, you had no reason to believe that solar is going to win. The reality is the solar demand actually was a winner only 2020 when it was very clear that um, people were already shifting to the EVs. Take note that the reality is that it started since 2018, but only when Tesla started showing profits on 2019 around October, that's when the entire EV revolution started. In 2020, you've got the SPAC mania for the EVs, the blessed EV makers. And that demand and that money going into all these EVs is showing you that the next phase of the silver industrial demand is not necessarily PV or photovoltaic panels, solar panels, but actually on the battery electric vehicles. So I'd say that that's the same thing with industrial metals like lithium and nickel and so forth and copper and all of that. Let's talk about Hecla Mining. Hecla Mining is also a silver miner. Notice that in the last 10 years, 2011 to 2021, you are seeing $4.80 go down to a dollar. And so far in 2020, it has been just rising all the way. A dollar fifty here and then two dollars here, three dollars, went to six dollars. Notice that that five dollar is really supported. You could see higher lows from all the silver mines, may it be OTC or may it be New York Stock Exchange listed. The better ones on the charts are actually the New York Stock Exchange listed. First Majestic Silver, also doing well. Notice that 2011 to 2021, these companies are trying to hit near all-time highs. So $24 to $16, notice that from $5, this made a 5x. So 2020 lows to $24, it didn't go back down anymore to 11 the lowest in the past uh, months is just $16, almost nearing the resistance of the past few years. So the prior resistance at $16 is becoming the support for First Majestic Silver Corp. Or ticker symbol, FSM. $16 is getting supported. Fortuna Silver Mines, another listed MPP in New York. You could see that this one for the last 10 years has been dwindling from $6 to $2, no breakouts whatsoever. But what happened? I think that everyone is acknowledging that there might be a silver squeeze. A silver squeeze uh, proponent is uh, really a believer of electric vehicles and solar panels. Take note, $6 went as high as 10 uh, 2 to 10 or a drop to $6 is just a 50% Fibonacci. 2 plus 10 is 12 divided by 2 is 6. That tells you it's a 50% retracement. It follows all the bullish technical signs. And that $6 is actually prior resistance equal support. So all of these are actually very bullish charts, whether you believe me or not. Okay, let's talk about more things. What's the use of silver 
All right. So you've already known that in the last 10 years, photovoltaics has been going well. You've got also industrials and the silver demand has been relatively at 1,000, right? It's 1,000 million metric tons. It's not likely to stop because industry innovation, even if, um, even if they say that right now, solar panels will not need as many milligrams per cell. So there's a group that said that CRU group estimated that each solar cell today is just using 111 milligrams of silver per cell, decreasing from 521 milligrams per cell in 2009, meaning they're able to do it more efficiently, 80% less silver, but the same type of efficiency. Okay, so you're also seeing, however, that despite that 80% drop, you've got solar rooftop revolution. Solar power installations from 2011 to 2019, this is less than 40, and now it's 120. It's expected to actually go to about 300 to 400, at least 500 in the next decade. So no matter if your silver per cell is actually um, going down from a percentage in every panel, the level of solar power installations that we would see in our lifetime is expected to fivefold or even tenfold. So um, it's almost impossible not to see the demand outstrip supply. There's actually this forecast. The growth in silver demand is actually on the green technologies. Take note that um, silver demand is expected to hit something like 140 million ounces every year. Um, that's just on the fact in automotive nuclear solar. So they are all going to use that. A huge chunk is still on the automotive electric vehicles, basically. So um, everyone seeing that silver prices will benefit from surge in solar panels and 5G. So this is um, the biggest demand for you. And um, if you're wondering, uh, we already said it has incredibly low electrical resistance. Um, other metals cannot match. While there are some metals that are trying to explore with copper, it still doesn't work. Silver's high conductivity maximally converts that sunlight into electricity. So, so far, take note that the solar panel manufacturing industry is using 8%, 8 to 10% of the world's annual physical silver supply. If that were to triple, then you've got that imbalance in demand. That will um, temporarily re mean the rise in price of silver. Silver fabrication demand is charging higher. So this is um, millions of ounces. So 1,000 million metric ounces right now. Everyone's saying that silver will be very critical to the solar power generation over the next 10 years, building blocks of solar panels and clean energy technology. So there is that demand. You only have the same mines on the supply. And you've got, of course, all the economy and what's the future behind. So you've got inflation, and this is where silver chart today right now is. From 2011, I, I told you that the average price about $35. It reached a peak of 47. So people are saying that in the next 10 years, although you might be saying that that's a long time, um, we will go back here to at least $35, the same price in the last 2011 to 2012, 2013 areas. So these are the levels that we, we are we are thinking that is the short-term target. So within the next maybe five years, if you believe that EVs are going to go up, then there's a chance that $20 will go back to 35 So this has been the same uh, chart for the last seven, eight years, 2013 to 2020. Notice that silver has stayed below $20. It broke that demand $20 last year because of the outstripping of battery. You need so much batteries and solar. So you could see that this is a strong shift because of the clean energy shift. Um, what are the kinds of returns that you would see if there was an inflation bonanza mania, not necessarily on, um, not necessarily on the industrial metals? Ah, sorry, not necessarily on the industrial demand use case. What if people actually hoarded it? So there was a time when people actually hoarded it, 1978 to 1980. This was the returns that you could get in just about a few years. So about 289% capital, lake mines, dome mines, Hecla mining, Newmont mining, Dickinson mines, Homestake mining, Sigma mines, giant yellow knife mines. Um, it's about 200 to 300% in about two years. And then for the junior miners, the smaller miners, these are the types of returns. Something like 10x. Carolyn Mines was 17x, $3 to 57. 
Mosquito Creek Gold, 70 cents to $7 or a 10x move. Northern North Air Mines, 3 to 10. Silver Standard, 58 cents to $2.50. Lincoln Resources, 78 cents to $20. Lornex, 15 to 85. Imperial Metals, 36 cents to $2. Anglo Bomark Mines, 180 to 685. Avino Mines, Copper Lake, David Minerals, Eagle River Mines, Meston Lake Resources, Silverado Mines, Wharf Resources. We'll see about 10x, 27x, 5x, depending on the small junior miners. So you could see that uh, the 1980s mania might actually repeat. We just don't know if it's going to repeat in the next 10 years in our life. Um, so it's important for you to understand, too, that right now, money printing has only benefited the 1% at the expense of the middle class. In order to protect your wealth, you want to buy something that cannot be um, increased over time or you cannot print it. So silver is actually one of those assets. And this is why a lot of people are discussing in many forums such as Reddit and a lot of YouTubers talked about the silver squeeze. If you want to know more about that, you can actually check Wall Street Silver. Uh, they've got their own YouTube channel. I think it's a very useful uh, website for your, for your um, knowledge. So this is the share of the total net worth that's held by the top 1%. You could see the richest of the rich are actually hoarding a percentage of the silver supply. Meanwhile, this is the 50th to 90th percentile. The, 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 the poorer you are, the less silver you actually own. So there's something of uh, something that you uh, should do if you want to be able to fight inflation. Uh, so I said that Hecla Mining was one of the companies that still existed in 1980s. So it still exists today. Take note that this company got founded in 1891. So it operates a silver and gold production company. They have lead, zinc, bulk concentrates, smelters, and brokers. So it operates through the following business segments. The Greens Creek, the Lucky Friday, Casa Berardi, la la la. So you could see that these are just a few miners in the world. So the most lost on silver are actually, in my view, the doomsday prepper stacker. I agree. They believe that inflation is high, so they want to go long gold, silver, and precious metals. And because the best hedge is never going to be cash, and if you think that inflation will run wild, you want to go long precious metals, industrial metals. So you can pray for the best that inflation doesn't happen, but you want to always prepare for the worst. This is the reason why you are investing in the first place, to protect your cash from getting down to toilet paper. Um, whoa, so, okay, so let's talk about buy what you can. You shouldn't actually allocate too much because if the price doesn't move, at least this is just an insurance. So usually you just want to buy a, a portion of your portfolio in a sense, 1%, 2%, 3%, because you never know. If it goes up, at least you have it. If long-term inflation does happen, it's very helpful to have it. Awesome 10x isn't a get-rich-quick thing, but you want to just deal with probabilities. So because we believe in solar and we believe in EVs, it's impossible for me not to say that I'm long silver. Also understand the following things. Biden has an infrastructure plan, the $2 trillion. It is going to be spent in the following things. In-home care, affordable housing, electric vehicle incentives is about $600 billion, roads and bridges, high-speed broadband, electric grid and clean energy, public schools, public transit, railways, water systems, domestic manufacturing, disaster resilience, National Science Foundation, and supply chain support. With this infrastructure plan, let's take a look at it. He wants to install 500 million solar panels over the next five years. Goldman is estimating that installation of solar panels will jump from 2019 to 2023. Installations are expected to also increase overseas, especially in China. The U.S. election outcome is not murky anymore. Uh, this was a time that uh, people were still suggesting whether Joe Biden was going to win, but we know that Joe Biden won. So the economic recovery is far less clear with new coronavirus surging. Nonetheless, uh, Citigroup analysts are projecting a $40 price target over the next 12 months, driven by the investors' desire for safety, as well as the industrial demand once the recovery picks up. They actually see a return of the 2010 to 11 bull market in silver as demand is continuing to rise amidst, in China, 6% from both industrial buyers and retail investors. You can argue that demand can happen. You have a demand supply shortage 
if two things happen, retail investors hoard uh, and industrial buyers who need it the most need to have it. So they have to put it in their inventories. Uh, a few things are happening right now. You're seeing that aluminum, industrial metals are growing. So this is September. We got $1.50 September 2020, $1.50, $2.50, $3.50. This is chalco or aluminum in China. What's happening in copper? You could see that since October 2020, $8 rallied to 23 made a pullback back to 14 and then continuing uptrend. So you're seeing that the uptrend in all the industrial metals are in place. How about silver? So I said that it's already going up from about $12 here to as high as 24 or 100%. If the demand it out, is outstripping supply, it can go to $35. CFDs on silver, you can I actually buy not necessarily the silver, can just have paper silver. So these are just um, derivatives of the actual silver coin. There's actually news that a lot of Perth mints are actually really suffering a shortage of silver as retail investors are actually hoarding all the metal. So five of the key commodity inputs into the manufacturing processes for renewables. So this is the most undervalued asset according to Jim Rogers. These are the values uh, as of copper, um, cobalt, copper, tin, nickel, and silver. So these is as of the March 2020 coronavirus. The largest move is actually silver. That's where the most demand is. Then you've got the, the next is tin. Then you've got um, cobalt, nickel, copper. So you've got these names. Very strong movements, all uptrend. Now, the global silver industrial demand versus the net physical and ETF investments, you could see that the industrial demand is 490 as of 2020, and the physical ETF investments about 585. So, um, if the physical ETF investment is um, keeping that silver and they want to sell it to the industrial demand, then the prices would naturally go up. So you could see that the physical ETFs are actually growing in nature. From 163, 143, 268 to 585, a lot of uh, ETFs right now are keeping it in, uh, in a bank, which is the Perth Mint. Perth Mint is Australia. Perth Mint has Australian gold and Australian uh, silver. Now, with Australia being one of the largest commodity exporters around the world, is it rising? Yes. You can notice that since 2020, the dollar um, has lost against Australia. Australian dollar has risen from a low of six, actually the lowest about 50 plus cents, rallied to 77 cents or a 50% increase in your currency. Um, so naturally, a lot of Australians are happy and a lot of Australian um, dollar earners are also happy. Australian and Kiwi dollars are in demand as economies and commodities are outperforming. The dollars have, uh, Australian and Kiwi dollars have edged higher as economic news at home and strengthened commodity prices have globally underpinned the sentiment. In fact, bonds also calmed after last week's ructions. Aussie is 78 cents, a uh, strong move, um, even as there's a surge in global bond yields, poking investors out of riskier assets. It faces a layer of resistance at 80 cents, but it is still um, that that is the three-year top. Anyway, um, let's take a look. Australia will be rich, as I said. They're winning in all fronts. So that is the strong movement. When they said about the three-year resistance, they're talking about this one. What happens when 80 cents breaks? It's 90 cents. And then above that, another $1.20. Top Australian experts of commodities, and they are becoming richer. Australia has $48 billion of iron ore, $16 billion of gold, $6.66 billion of aluminum oxide. Well, there, well, well, they have petroleum, gas, and crude petroleum. I don't think that is really a huge demand. So there. <clears throat> Let's talk about a few things, guys. I'm going to show to you the world silver. So this is the World Silver Survey in 2020. Can you still see? Oh, yeah, you can see the man. All right. So I'm using this as, um, as a guide. It was made by the Silver Institute by Washington, D.C. You can see that they've got so many partners. Um, major funding companies of the Silver Institute are these companies. 
Asahi Refining, Kuwer Mining, Endeavor Silver, First Majestic Silver, First Nilio Hecla Mining, Industria Españoles, Pan American Silver, Wheaton Precious Metals. I think that because I took uh, the top 10 silver mines, it tells you that the data is really good. Okay, so metals focus, no? All right, let me show you the most important parts of this one. This, this, um, so these are your major sponsors. QR Mining, Fresnillo, Pan American. All the, all the charts that I mentioned a while ago are here. QR Mining, Fresnillo, Paas, uh, Industria Españoles, Wheaton Precious Metals, um, Hecla Mining, and so forth. So if you're looking for which silver miners to buy into, I think you get the best of the best. Those are the companies. All right, so, um, Let's talk about the important ones. The, the page 50, I think, is the most important one. So I'll go start, start, start there. This, uh, let's read this together. Silver's pivotal role in the green energy. As I said, it has a vital role in the clean energy network. So um, it's not restricted to PVs as the efficient generation of renewable energy. It, if a single rotor blade in a wind turbine fails, it can cause catastrophic damage to both that turbine and its neighbors, and thus it's, um, it is essential. Right now, a single turbine can house up to 150 sensors checking inputs, including wind speed, weather, and vibration. This is a silver-bearing sensor. It improves grid management. Access to real-time data will enable energy companies to control voltage and network configuration. Among other functions, smart switches containing silver can automatically isolate problems and reroute power. These technologies also apply to legacy fuels, which will remain a notable contributor to global supply over the foreseeable future to significantly lower carbon emissions. Wait lang ah. Okay. So an electricity network integrating the generation consumption, so smart grids will need uh, a lot of uh, silver. Storage, let's talk about batteries. Energy storage using batteries will further improve the efficiency of renewable energy. Batteries are cutting the waste. Supply can be released on demand, particularly useful as renewables such as wind, solar, and hydro have variable output levels. Silver oxide batteries, which can handle high voltages, are very stable and have a long life. Therefore, it has an important role in providing renewable energy storage. Consumption. Okay, let's talk about computers. Silver-bearing controls, computers, and all the new technologies work together to boost reliability and efficiency. Consumers monitor and control usage through smart meters, and while distribution panels containing PCBs will feed electricity into homes. Excess supply can then be fed back to the grid, whether from microgeneration through a domestic solar panel or a larger scale, such as wind turbines. Now, perhaps the most exciting is the electric vehicles. Obviously, their total emissions are not zero, as the energy used for their production, powering, and disposal should even be taken into account. That said, the rising share of electricity generated from renewables means that their overall emissions are on a rapidly declining trajectory. Those renewables include PV, which will benefit as VEV growth continues to develop. BVs rely upon silver across a host of applications, ranging from semiconductors, sensors, harnesses, controls, fuses, switches, and displays. Sensors will play a significant role in enabling the technological requirements of BEVs through their continuous battery monitoring in order to process information from these sensors, overseeing the operation of a car's electronic system, processing, storing, analyzing the data. Further potential for silver use would be solid state batteries, your quantum scape. So developments in lithium metal solid state means that it has a silver carbon coating on the anode. It will face um, pressure from thrifting and substitution. However, as reliability and safety are a higher priority here than in, say, consumer electronics, this pressure will tend to be less intense. There are more gains for silver demand. The proliferation of chargers. Here, the white metal is primarily used in contacts and tips. Private homes could be equipped with wall chargers, such as the one you saw with Sunrun walls, right? The bright boxes. So while larger capacity roadside charges will also need to be installed in ever-growing numbers. The above all explains why the amount of silver in a BEV or a battery electric vehicle is greater than that in internal combustion engines or ICEs. That said, it is 
As we know, some recent gains in the fuel economy have been improved due to improved engine management, achieved through a number of increasingly sophisticated sensors or enhanced ECUs, many of which contain silver. Looking further ahead, it also has a role in the growing autonomous vehicle sector. This ties in with the expectations that the autonomous vehicle equipment will save energy, allowing these vehicles to reduce excessive acceleration and braking, restricting speed and managing traffic flow. AVs require a great number of silver-bearing components, including infrared radars, laser radar, which is the LIDAR, cameras, and motion sensors. These are your global semiconductor billings. Semiconductor Industry Association, you're seeing this growth, about $500 billion, 2010 to 2018. This is coming from the electrical market. Demand for switchgear remained robust, particularly for low-voltage applications. Consumer electronics demand was, boost, was boosted by your cell phone manufacturing in India, with companies like Apple and Samsung ramping up local production. India is now the second largest fabricator globally behind China. From just a handful of cell phone manufacturing units in 2014, the country now has 268 handsets and related access accessory manufacturing units. Silver demand in the other industrial category, while they fell last year, that would be 2020, the extent of the decline was lower compared to other categories, such as other subsectors actually outperform. Usage in the food continued to grow, partly because of silver-coated cardamom and betel nuts. Interestingly, demand from the food industry and indelible ink makers, such as silver nitrate, saw a flurry of elections in India last year. Traditional <coughs> Indian sweets are distributed widely by political parties, which increase sales of barak or silver foil. Um, construction sector and then 5G smartphone ratio. Smartphone shipments and 5G smartphone penetration ratio is expected to go from less than 5% to 35%. And because of the increase of smartphone 5G, you will need, again, a lot of electronics that will need silver. Um, Chinese industrial silver demand was virtually flat last year, but um, this was largely just due to a policy delay towards a subsidy-free target. So Chinese panel production surpassed 100 gigawatts, two-thirds of which was exported to emerging markets. This is Japan and China, industrial fabrication. We studied um, a company called Canadian Solar. Canadian Solar just installed the first, um, their, uh, their large um, solar panels in Japan. So Canadian Solar is the Japanese infrastructure player. Um, they, did, uh, they did a partnership with uh, the largest electricity utility in Japan, and they are providing solar there, so Canadian solar. Okay. Um, there's more. Um, yeah, so there's more. Either way. Um, wait. Anyway, so I'll... Um, so Japanese industrial... So you could see that technology progress and future silver demand, um, invention and obsolescence. So this is photography, but this is photovoltaics. So I'd say that because we are seeing a huge demand, it is our conclusion that we would have to buy a lot of silver in our portfolio. Let's talk about... Um, I don't think that you need to see the jewelry fabrication. Um, those are not that important, I think. I think the most important part that I just wanted to share was the, the solar play, the, the clean renewable energy play, so silver and green. The most important ones I've covered already, and then this. So I've already told you the supply. Supply is not really going as much higher than 1,000 million ounces a year. Mine production, hedging, silver price, recycling, official sector. So recycling can only do so much. Hope that helps you. And um, <clears throat> if, um, if you got any questions, you can ask. Uh, if none, then class is over. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.